Hello and welcome to Health Matters on Channels Television. Thank you for joining us. I am Mary Alale Yusuf. How many times has an accident, a man-made natural or intentional disaster happened and avoidable consequences have taken place because people, including professionals, did not know what to do or how to behave in the circumstance? We hear of disaster officials clearing the area of unauthorized personnel and trying to give victims space. But what are the responsibilities of people in the area before professional help comes? And how should professionals themselves act when faced with these disasters? Trauma and orthopedic specialists usually have their hands full with the outcome of disasters. Let's see how they manage them. My guest on the show and in the studio today is the head Emergency Medical Services Department and Orthopedic Consultant from the National Orthopedic Hospital, it will be in Lagos. Dr. Ronti Babalola, you're welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Glad to be around today. Let me start by asking you, you know, we know sometimes that some, uh, some disasters, surgeons come, or at least EMTs come, what they call... Uh, um, Emergency medical technicians. Paramedics. Yes, paramedics. Okay. And they lift them up and take them to the hospital. Yes. Do, do, we have that kind of, um, do we have that kind of service here or must the patients be brought to the hospital by well-meaning citizens, family and all that? Okay. So um, I think the concept you are trying to paint here is the concept of what we call the first responders. Yes. And um, there are two broad categories of first responders. They are the trained first responders. And uh, I would describe the other category as the untrained first responders. Now, the first question has to do with the trained uh, first responders. Uh, in the structure of Lagos State, we have the uh, LASEMs, who are trained to a large extent uh, in the delivery of this kind of service. What did you call them? LASEMs. LASEMs, what's that? Uh, that's the Lagos State Emergency Management Service. Okay, Lagos has everything of their Lagos own. Lagos has so proud like of that. it. <laughs> okay, because uh, when we talk about disasters, we talk about the local response, the regional response, and the national response. So immediately you have, or immediately a disaster happens, there has to be a structure on, on ground locally to attend to uh, such challenges. So apart from last time, you also have the last ambos which is the Lagos State Ambulance Service. Okay. Okay, so uh, these, categories of, in these categories of individuals are trained to, are trained first responders. So when they are contacted, they can go get to the site uh, of such incident and they can uh, put up the appropriate care uh, when such uh, occurrences happen. Uh, of course, I must be quick to say that uh, when in the face of a disaster really, uh, the first thing that should come to mind is safety. Yes. So even when you have a first responders, when they get to the scene of a disaster, the first thing is to ensure that uh, there is no risk of what we call a second hit. A second, a hit, second hit. So a second hit means that, okay, for example, um, let's paint a picture of the, there's this uh, uh, truck conveying fuel. fuel. Oh, yes. And has fallen on the road. And fuel is spilling. Fuel is, fuel is spilling, and uh, you know that there is a risk or a disaster in the making. Fire, let's say fire is on your mind. Fire is on the, on the mind of those around. Or let's paint another picture, a car burning, and there's a truck coming on high speed towards that side, carrying fuel. So there's already uh, a, an exposed, a naked flame, and if that truck maintains that speed, Ignition. you know there's a major disaster in the making. So the first thing is that you want to make sure that you control the traffic coming into that area. Whatever vehicle coming to that area is capable of uh, making a diversion away from that potential trigger point. Because once you have a second trigger, it tends to magnify the effects of the first incident. And that's okay, what... Okay, so let me ask you a question that the answer may seem obvious, but some people might not know. What if somebody is coming down the road and sees a vehicle on fire? Yes. What should the person do? Quickly pass it or find another road? 
Okay, so um, if someone, just as you said, someone is approaching an area, sees a fire flame, now the first thing you want to take is, the decision is, do I want to offer help? help. And uh, help alleviate what potential, uh, the potential danger that may result from this. And that is what we tend to advocate for. Uh, of course, uh, you need to be appropriately equipped to offer the appropriate help. So your deciding to offer help mean, means that, of course, you're equ equipped with a fire extinguisher. You know how to operate a fire extinguisher. You can approach the vehicle safely without causing harm to yourself or harm to any other person around. How does a passerby know all these things? Oh. That, okay, I can approach safely and I can operate a fire extinguisher. What's so difficult about operating a fire extinguisher? So it comes with training. When we talk about uh, disaster management, uh, we, talk about, we talk about it on two categories. We talk about prevention and we talk about intervention. We so at the level, the prevention. Yes, so at the level of, uh, at which we are speaking now, the emphasis is on prevention. So the question is how do we get our population trained how do we get individuals trained to respond in their own little way to uh, or potential or established cases of disaster? No, but are you thinking of it really? Because we all have fire extinguishers in the car. Yes. But when there's a fire, you'll be shocked how people behave. They don't even remember there's an extinguisher. Or maybe it's expired mm -hmm. or, you know... Suddenly, it, it just looks like rocket science. What do I press? What do I twist? Yes. You know. So it, it, it still boils down to training. So you, you're driving a vehicle. Part of the requirements for driving on the road is that you have a fire extinguisher in your vehicle. Now, just as you rightly mentioned, do, do, do you regularly check if your fire extinguisher is expired? Does it move from the green indicator to the red indicator and all that? So people need to know this. Then the event that is not expired, do you know the, the button to take off and where to press and how to direct the fire okay. so I don't direct the... Just your movement yes. is teaching me. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what is safe? Green indicator or red indicator? So green points to the fact that the uh, fire extinguisher is still useful. It can serve its purpose. Once it's red, then you need to change the fire extinguisher. Okay, so I'm really glad that uh, somebody who... who doesn't have, you know, professional training, can actually be a first responder. What else can someone do when there's a disaster? And we're not just talking about car accidents. We've heard of people being carried in floods, okay. you know, and, and such things. Once in a while, there's an earth tremor. Yes. And then the, um, a building collapse. So teach us what, before we go to you and <laughs> the professional, what does a person do? to stay, to be safest, mm -hmm. and to be of greatest help in such a situation. Okay, so um, you mentioned two common instances we may have in our environment, and that's the cases of uh, collapsed building, uh, cases of uh, flooding, and uh, the attendant problems that may follow uh, these uh, scenarios. Okay, so the first thing an individual should do is, number one, to ensure he's, uh, that particular person is safe. Meaning that, okay, the building, portion of the building is collapsed. The other part that is here to collapse appears tilted and about to collapse. You don't go into you that kind of the building. Space. Okay. So in that instance, the first thing you want to do is keep any other person from getting into that building. That's the first thing. We call that condoning the area. Condone it, make sure nobody, no, no one else gets into that building. Now, depending on the much of training the person in question has had. The next thing you may think of doing is calling for help. Okay, give us the number. So we have a few uh, emergency numbers, 767 uh, seven is one number we can call out, 112, you can call out those emergency numbers. Th those seem to be the two numbers that we have for every single emergency in Lagos. Uh, and that's Lagos, right? Lagos, it's not even yes. all over Nigeria. Mm -hmm. So what happens when there are diverse kinds of emergencies and many people are calling, can they handle it? Yes, yeah, so this part of it, that still comes on that, that structure of preparedness. Because more often than not, certain levels of disaster occur without um, any warning sign. 
Yes, there are some disasters, for example, naturally an earthquake, there may have been tremors and all that. Um, take, for example, uh, if I may call it a man-made disaster, an oil tanker collapses on the road and uh, spills is full on the road and there is uh, this individual roasting corn across that same road. Oh, wow. Of course, you can imagine the explosion that, that will result place, yes. uh, from that. So uh, it still boils down to uh, preparation. Uh, which is one of, of course, when we talk about disaster, we talk about multi-agency involvement. A disaster is beyond uh, the control of uh, the health professional alone. We talk about the law enforcement agents. We talk about the telecom industry. We talk about security agents and all that. So when we talk about the telecom industry, that's where they need to come in. What uh, are you doing with law enforcement? So law enforcement uh, uh, individuals that will need to come into that picture to help condone that area. Make okay. sure people, you know, funny enough, you know at times when accidents happen, uh, those who may call good Samaritans are there to render help. Some are just there to plunder the victims. You are even rendering help. Someone is trying to size you up. Uh, this uh, good Samaritan, what can I get off him or her? No, that unfortunately do. Do you really take that into consideration, I mean, in Nigeria? Yes, we do. Because if you look at the framework of uh, emergency response, you cannot adequately respond to a disaster situation without these uh, affiliate agencies stepping in to offer the necessary assistance. Okay, so give us an idea of the range of injuries uh, a person could have that you would have to respond to? Okay, so uh, when we speak in the, uh, in the face of disaster, the range of injuries is broad. And we medically, we divide the body into systems. So for us, I'm an orthopedic surgeon, we talk about the musculoskeletal system. That's the muscles, uh, the bones, the uh, blood pipes, the nerves. Uh, we talk about uh, the role of uh, the, uh, well, if I may call them, I'm a surgeon, so forgive me if I'm strictly <laughs> speaking about surgeons. Of we talk about the uh, head, head injuries. Okay. We talk about the neurosurgeons. Uh, we talk about the chest injuries. We talk about uh, the chest surgeon, the cardiothoracic surgeons. We talk about the ab abdomen, the bowel. We talk about the general surgeon. We talk about the uh, urinary system. So we talk about the urologist. Of course, the other category of health workers also come in uh, because the other uh, someone who has sustained an injury to the forearm or to the leg may also be hypertensive, may be diabetic, and that may be equally important at the time of the incident. So more or less, it's a team effort. Uh, but strictly speaking of the uh, musculoskeletal system, the range of injuries include fractures of the bone of the arm, fracture of the bone of the forearm, of the femur, that's the thigh bone, of the leg bone, and even of the waist bone, what we call the pelvis. Now the fracture of the pelvis is particularly unique in that uh, when, and this is quite, this is a common scenario in the instance of a collapsed building. The building collapses on the individual, the individual is impaled under the weight of the structure of that building, the pelvis is forced open, it breaks open. And one interesting thing about the pelvis is that it causes bleeding inside. It does? Yes, it does. So this person- Probably uh, because it's puncturing something else? Yes, because the uh, broken bone is puncturing, possibly because it's puncturing a blood pipe. Okay. The bone itself- But the not of itself. Not, of, it, not of itself. Okay. Interestingly, even the pelvic bone itself has tiny blood pipes within it, what we call uh, the cancellous bone, that's the medical description of the bone of the, that makes up the pelvic bone, has tiny blood pipes. And once they are laid open, they just ooze out. You know, it's easier to press uh, a soft pipe and block it. Yes. But when the blood pipe is encased with the heart inside structure, the bone. so it's difficult to press it down to stop the bleeding. So the person just continues to bleed inside. And of course, the person is immobile by that time. Even if something is not resting on the person. Mm -hmm. With a broken pelvis, I don't think the person can walk. It will be difficult to move around at that point in time. And of course, uh, it's also important to mention at this point in time that, uh, just as I said earlier on, in the face of disasters, one thing we should anticipate is the fact that there may be multiple injuries. So there's a sequence, really, to, towards to the care of uh, 
uh, disaster victims. So that's when triage comes in. Triage. But we'll talk about all that when we come back from the break. We're going on a short break now. Please stay with us. Welcome back. It's Channels Television, and we are talking about response in disaster situations. The number to call is 0808-054-2233 if you have a question about disasters and the role of an orthopedic surgeon in the disasters. You can also tweet at CTV underscore Mary A or send me email moalale at channelstv.com while we continue the discussion. We have somebody with a broken pelvis. He's on the side of the road and a fire is already coming up. There's no professional responder on the scene. There's just a few people. Now, maybe he has a head injury. They call 767. They call 112. They're waiting for responders to come, but there's danger. Fire is coming. What can they do? I know there's something about immobilizing a head and all that kind of thing, but they've got to get this person away from that spot so that he doesn't burn before responders come. How do they do it? All right, so we, uh, well, it, it's, it's, it, the picture here is uh, it's like being caught between the devil and the <laughs> deep sea. Okay, so there are, there are two dangers here. There's the danger of a probable fire explosion. So, and uh, there's that urgent need to get the victim out of the scene of the accident or the incident, as the case may be. Now, in transferring patients, there's the concept of the uh, log of wood, or what we call log rolling. Yes, splint. So, ideally, you must transport that person as though you are transporting a log of wood with the okay. body straight. Why? Because uh, there are instances where the idea is that, oh, I can see a bruise around the waist area. It's probably gotten a broken pelvis. Whereas the more important injury at that point in time is a, a broken neck or a partially broken neck, if I may call it that way, uh, that is yet a broken neck that is yet to affect the spinal cord. So because if that broken bone in the neck shifts, compresses or cuts through the spinal cord, it could cause paralysis, There's right? paralysis in the least. That could also affect the respiration of the individual. The person can't breathe any longer. And of course, wow. imagine that it's not going to be a very uh, palatable end in that instance. So the whole idea is that if you must urgently transfer that particular individual, you make sure you transfer the person uh, using the log rule concept. So, so if you have a flat... Move, nothing must shift. Nothing must shift. So let's assume, okay, you, the individual is there, uh, maybe not so trained in emergency response. If you have a flat board, so long enough or big enough to accommodate that person, it's, it's more easily demonstrated than I described. Really. I can imagine. So there's a way we encourage at least three people or four people to, to lift handle. the person? No, it doesn't, the individual doesn't even need to be lifted. So all you need to do, someone holds the head straight while the person is just tilted over. Another person holds the shoulder and the chest from behind to turn the person over. A third person holds a hand in the pelvis and a hand in the leg, and the person is rolled over to the side uniformly, everything moving. So they have to probably count have to so count. that they can do it all together. All together. So the fourth person now slides in the board in the and once the board is just by the back of the injured individual, the person is now rolled back. Okay. And with that, he Lift or she can be out of the transferred away from Four the... people had to do that. Yes, that's, 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 that's the ideal. Worked more effectively that way. But am I right to say that it, uh, an easier thing to do, if the fire is not too large a fire, okay. it would be better to just put it out? Yes. If Unless it's, it's something uncontrollable. Yes, it goes back to the issue of uh, this uh, condoning and making sure that zone is safe to even respond in the first instance. So the first thing in disaster or emergency response is still safety. Tell make us sure. how you triage. Okay, so uh, triage uh, basically entails prioritizing uh, treatment based on injury severity. And instances where we have to triage, uh, instances where we have multiple casualty uh, incidents. So you have, uh, depending on the capacity of the uh, institution involved in the care of the injured uh, 
individuals. So the capacity of some institutions is five, some is 10, some is uh, 15 or 20. So you look at those, the, at times they are brought in all at once, and all that, imagine six individuals brought to a hospital, or let's say 10, and they're all injured. So who do I attend to first? So that's where the concept of triage is. Who is the most injured? Looking at them, taking a look at them all, who is the more injured, who is the least injured? Who can afford to wait and who needs immediate care? I heard that the person who is screaming is the one who can <laughs> afford to wait because they know that this is this one is alive. He's fine. Yes, yes. <laughs> well, not necessarily, but maybe a guy. Okay. Because one of the things we do to assess uh, the health status of an individual, the first one of the first things a responder should do is to speak to the injured individual. Are you okay? So if the individual is able to respond Coherency. clearly, yes, okay. you can hear the voice. It means the airway is open. Wow. So meaning he or she can take in air. And the airway and breathing is one of the first elements of life. So the person shouting is just telling you my airway is fated. It's clear. <laughs> the final decision rests with the judgment of the healthcare provider to determine okay. who is the most injured and who is the least injured. Of course, the most injured will need the priority care while the least injured can still afford some time uh, to get the uh, more injured person stable, and then, of course, we respond to everybody eventually. Okay, so, and that way you can get to as many people as possible. As possible. At least more people than if you had done it haphazardly. Haphazardly, yes. Okay, um, do you have to carry around some emergency stuff with you? And should we? as regular citizens of this country carry around emergency stuff for any sort of disaster? Yes, I, I think one of the um, points the, uh, that has been advocated now for drivers now is to at least have a first aid kit in the vehicle. They should? Yeah, well, if, if you do, if, if individuals do, number one, can serve the individual driving the vehicle, then if not for the, individ if not for the individuals in the vehicle, someone who gets injured by the roadside. What's Maybe. in it? Okay, so you have things like uh, you can use in dressing a wound. You have a uh, cotton wool. You have a plaster. Uh, if uh, you can, you can have what we call a piece of gauze. So with that, you bandages? can... Bandages? Bandages. Then what we call the, yes, the grip bandage. So with that, you can, when, you, ha when the, uh, you have an individual that has an injury, the wound can be adequately dressed, pending when definitive care arises. At times, we also Do you have something like a tourniquet? Can, because sometimes someone is bleeding, maybe yes. you want to stop the bleeding, you know, from continuing before help comes. Yes, um, a tourniquet will also be handy in such instances. Of course, uh, anything, there's the appropriate tourniquet that uh, we use medically. At times, people tend to improvise, uh, like a, a man may decide to Change, make his shirt a tourniquet, tie the a person is bleeding heavily from a broken leg or broken tie bone, and okay, you decide to sacrifice, the, you are wearing a jacket like this, decide to take off the inner shirt and wear the jacket only <laughs> to save a life. And you improvise your shirt into a tourniquet just to reduce the bleeding from that point of injury. Okay, our time is up. But 112767. Yes. That is very valuable. Very I've valid. called the number, by the way, and they came in good time. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on the show. <laughs> Thank you for having me around. Thank you for being with us on the show. Have a lovely day. I am Mary Alale Yusuf.